In the last three videos in this series, we've looked at 44 differences between Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholic, aka Roman Rite Catholic churches. This is the final video discussing these differences. Let's begin with number 45. Especially some in Orthodoxy have pointed out differences between the Catholic code of laws that govern the church, called canon law, and the Orthodox Church's canons. The Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America says that the holy canons stem from three main sources, ecumenical synods, local synods, and fathers of the church. They go on to draw out the distinction from the Catholic Church. Unlike the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church, the canon law of the Orthodox Church has not been codified. Neither is it prescriptive in character, anticipating a situation before it actually takes place. Instead, it is corrective in nature, responding to a situation once it has occurred. Because of the absence of a universal codification binding upon all autocephalous or self-governing Orthodox churches, great importance is attached to the local legislation of each of these churches. Proto-Presbyter Thomas Hopko's The Orthodox Faith article on canons on the OCA website says the canon laws are not positive laws in the juridical sense and cannot be easily identified with laws as understood and operative in human jurisprudence. According to Father Alexander Rentel of the OCA, other differences include that the Catholic Church has regularly added new canon law while there have been no new Orthodox canons in over a millennium, and that while the Orthodox Church works with the old canons and conciliar activity of the past, in the Catholic Church the latest canon law is the canon law, and that is what is worked with exclusively. Notably, the Eastern Catholic Churches follow a different set of canon law than the Latin Church. Catholics may view the question of differences in Orthodox and Catholic canon law differently than the Orthodox sources I have quoted, but there is an obvious difference in the way the two traditions handle this matter. The sign of the cross for most Catholics is done from left to right, while for Orthodox churches and Eastern Catholics it is right to left. The Orthodox Church in America website says, The Orthodox place their first two fingers and thumb together to form a sign of the triune God and cross themselves from the head to the breast and from shoulder to shoulder right to left. Catholic.net says, Catholics grow up making the sign of the cross. It is second nature to us. We place our left hand on our chest and we move our right hand to our forehead as we say, in the name of the Father. Then we move our right hand to our chest as we say, and of the Son. And as we move our right hand from left to our right shoulders, we say, and of the Holy Spirit. Then we join our hands together as we say, Amen. They also point out three ways that the fingers have historically been held when the sign was made and point out that the open hand method is most common today. One area that we've discussed very little so far is that of prayer. For Catholics, an extremely well-known prayer practice is that of praying the rosary, which is done with a set of prayer beads in a necklace-like arrangement and involves many prayers, notably 53 Hail Mary prayers among them. For Orthodox, the Orthodox Church in America says, The Roman Catholic devotion of praying the rosary is not a part of the Orthodox Christian tradition, as this devotion in its present form dates from about the 15th century, hundreds of years after Roman Catholicism separated herself from the Orthodox Church. In Orthodoxy, there is, however, the practice of praying the Jesus Prayer. O Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner, on a set of prayer beads, generally 100 in number. This tradition is especially upheld by Orthodox monks and nuns, although a growing number of laypersons also make use of such beads. This usage, however, is completely unrelated in origin, form, and content to Roman Catholicism's rosary. The question arises whether either side ever looks like the other, and the answer is yes, but only small minorities. Western Rite Orthodox churches, which are minuscule in number in orthodoxy and somewhat controversial too, often do use the rosary like St. Paul Orthodox Church in Katy, Texas, and many Eastern Catholics conversely will use an orthodox style prayer rope. On the subject of the Jesus prayer, this leads to another difference, which is the orthodox practice of hesychasm. The Orthodox Faith series on the Orthodox Church in America website describes it in this way. The Jesus Prayer is the prayer of the heart in silence in this form of prayer. The article goes on to say, In the hesychist method of prayer, the person sits alone in a bodily position with his head bowed and his eyes directed toward his chest or his stomach. He continually repeats the prayer with each aspiration and breath, placing his mind and his heart by concentrated attention. He empties his mind of all rational thoughts and discursive reasoning, and also voids his mind of every picture and image. Then, without thought or imagination, but with all proper attention and concentration, he rhythmically repeats the Jesus prayer in silence. Hesekia means silence. And through this method of contemplative prayer is united to God by the indwelling of Christ in the Spirit. According to the Fathers, such a prayer, when faithfully practiced within the total life of the Church, brings the experience of the uncreated divine light of God and unspeakable joy to the soul. Its purpose is to make man a servant of God. 
The article also says that without exception, someone using this method should have a spiritual guide, that one must be a person of genuine humility and sanity, and to use the method without guidance and humble wisdom is to court spiritual disaster as it comes with many temptations. There are body positions and breathing techniques associated with hesychasm, but this has also sometimes been restricted due to abuses. Most Catholics are completely unfamiliar with this practice as it is not part of the Catholic tradition generally. Some in Eastern Catholicism do practice it, however. Some orthodox explanations of the experiences of the hesychist theologically rely on the essence and energy's distinction, so some orthodox would view Catholic theology as inconsistent with the full concept of hesychasm. Among the many differences in liturgical practices between Catholics and orthodox is included the Stations of the Cross. Of this, the Dynamic Catholic website says, Practiced for over 1,000 years, praying the Stations of the Cross is a popular devotion practiced by Catholics during Lent. Each station shows a pivotal moment during Jesus' Passion. Most Catholic churches have a depiction of each station either inside or outside of the church. During Lent, a priest or deacon will lead a procession to each station and lead a congregation in specific prayers. These prayers allow us to reflect on Jesus' sacrifice for us. Deacon Peter Gardner of the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia has said, There's nothing particularly unorthodox about the Stations of the Cross, or at least there doesn't have to be, but it just isn't part of our liturgical heritage. We don't really have any context to put it in without just sort of abruptly doing it, and it would feel out of place. There are a small number of Orthodox parishes that use some form of Western Rite, and they tend to do it. Some Orthodox people also do it on their own. Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia Archpriest John Whiteford says, In the Orthodox Church, we make prostrations, or full bows to the ground, as part of our prayer life. Sometimes, prostrations are made even during the Divine Liturgy. But there are certain rules about this, and these rules are also subject to local practice. A Russian Orthodox parish says that they are made when venerating the cross, an icon, the gospel, or holy relics. Similarly, Father John Breck of the OCA says that prostrations are made in personal prayer and in liturgical services. This is also mentioned as a practice in the Antiochian Archdiocese. Prostration is made more difficult in North American churches with pews, and some such churches do not have them during the regular liturgy. Outside of Eastern Catholics, most Catholics never prostrate themselves as part of public worship. Prostration is still a part of ordination, but it involves lying completely flat on the ground. Some Catholics will also practice prostration during personal adoration of the Eucharist. Catholics and Orthodox have differing views of canonized sainthood. Both churches realize that a person may be a saint without official recognition, but there is nonetheless the idea of recognized saints in both churches. For the Catholic Church, a person being considered for sainthood first becomes venerable, then blessed, then saint. To get to the first step, venerable, requires a declaration by the Pope. The next step, to become blessed, is called beatification and requires that a miracle occur due to someone requesting intercession by the departed. The final step for a blessed to become a saint is called canonization, and another miracle is required here. There are some exceptions. A pope can waive the miracle requirements, and a martyr only needs one miracle after beatification. For the Orthodox Church, there are not three steps. The terms glorification or canonization may be used synonymously to refer to the process of declaring someone as a saint. Miracles could be something that causes a person to be considered for glorification, but they're not necessary. What is necessary is a virtuous life of obvious holiness and that their writings be fully Orthodox. The Greek Orthodox Archdiocese says there is no official procedure or necessary ecclesiastical recognition, that Christian people accept and honor them as saints, and that this acceptance may come from poverty popular acclaim. The Catholic Church differs from Orthodox churches in that cremation is a permissible option for Catholics. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, The Church permits cremation, provided that it does not demonstrate a denial of faith in the resurrection of the body. However, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops does quote from the Order of Christian Funerals on their website, which says that cremation does not enjoy the same value as burial of the body. In 2016, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith issued guidelines saying that ashes should not be scattered in the air, on land, or in the sea, or made into jewelry, nor should they be kept in an urn at a home. Rather, they should be kept in a cemetery or similar sacred place. This was slightly loosened in December 2023, allowing a small amount of the ashes to be kept in a place significant to the deceased person under certain circumstances. Cremation is generally not acceptable for the Orthodox Church. One Serbian Orthodox parish states plainly, it is the position of the Orthodox Church that cremation is forbidden for its faithful members. The Orthodox Church in America says that Byzantine canon law disallows cremation, but that there are those who want to reopen the question. They also say that the vast majority of Orthodox would say that cremation denies the value of the human body and is to be avoided.
Eastern Orthodox and Roman Catholics use different calendars. Some consider this a minor issue, but within Orthodoxy the calendar issue can get controversial, and there are groups known as Old Calendarists, Genuine Orthodox, or True Orthodox that have split with the mainstream of Orthodoxy over this issue, and they still use the Julian calendar. Many of the autocephalous Orthodox churches today use the revised Julian calendar, but others, including the Serbian, Georgian, and most notably the Russian church, still use the Julian calendar. Although they use the so-called Old Calendar, this is not an issue that causes them to break communion with new calendar using churches. For those churches that use the Julian calendar, most every church holiday will land in a different time than about every other church in the rest of the world, the Catholic Church included. However, for the rest of the Orthodox Church that has adopted the revised Julian calendar, things look almost entirely in line with the Gregorian calendar used by the vast majority of the Catholic Church. So most of the time, there's no difference. The big exception, of course, is Easter. The revised Julian calendar keeps Easter following the Julian calculations, so all of Orthodoxy celebrates Easter on the same day, different from when most of the Catholic Church celebrates it. Though there have been discussions about finding a way to change this, nothing has happened yet. Eastern Catholics also vary in the calendars they follow, commonly matching the Orthodox churches in their nation. Contraception is generally viewed as an area where Orthodoxy and Catholicism differ. Greek Orthodox Archbishop Callistus Ware wrote in his book The Orthodox Church, concerning contraceptives and other forms of birth control, differing opinions exist within the Orthodox Church. In the past, birth control was in general strongly condemned, but today a less strict view is coming to prevail, not only in the West but in traditional Orthodox countries. Many Orthodox theologians and spiritual fathers consider that the responsible use of contraception within marriage is not in itself sinful. In their view, the question of how many children a couple should have and at what intervals is best decided by the partners themselves, according to the guidance of their own consciences. In Proto-Presbyter Thomas Hopko's The Orthodox Faith article that mentions this topic on the OCA website, it is said, The voluntary control of birth in marriage is only permissible, according to the essence of a spiritual life, when the birth of a child will bring danger and hardship. The Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America says, Because of the lack of a full understanding of the implications of the biology of reproduction, Production. Earlier writers tended to identify abortion with contraception. However, of late a new view has taken hold among Orthodox writers and thinkers on this topic, which permits the use of certain contraceptive practices within marriage for the purpose of spacing children, enhancing the expression of marital love, and protecting health. Meanwhile, St. John the Evangelist Orthodox Church in Pennsylvania, which is Antiochian Orthodox, says, except for medical reasons, contraception is generally not acceptable in the eyes of the Church. Abstinence and NFP, on the other hand, are in line with Church teaching. So there are varieties of views and no dogmatic position of the Church on the matter. For Catholics, the situation is different. The Church teaches that it is always intrinsically wrong to use contraception to prevent new human beings from coming into existence. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says that natural family planning is supported by the Church and is the only authentic approach available to husbands and wives. Orthodox Church and Catholic Church practices related to fasting are also most commonly quite different. First, let's discuss the position in the Catholic Church, particularly the churches that follow the Roman Rite. According to canon law, Catholics should abstain from flesh meat, not including fish, on most Fridays, but it is also allowed that each bishop's conference substitute other forms of penance. For example, the Bishop's Conference of England and Wales in 1984 removed the abstinence requirement and allowed other forms of penance, but then reinstated it in 2011. In the United States, in 1966, the Conference of Bishops established new norms in an attempt to give greater vitality to Friday penance. The Friday abstinence from meat requirement as a church law was removed, but Catholics were and are still called on to have other works of self-denial and personal penance on Fridays. The Bishop's Conference said, We give first place to abstinence from flesh meat. We do so in the hope that the Catholic community will ordinarily continue to abstain from meat by free choice, as formerly we did in obedience to church law. The bishops mentioned a renewed focus on temperance and the use of alcoholic beverages as another form of penitential witness. Jimmy Aiken of Catholic Answers says of this, As a result, there appears to be no legal obligation in the United States to practice penance on Friday, but Friday remains a day on which the bishops have urged all to do penance and, in particular, recommended the continued practice of abstinence. So the Friday abstinence from meat requirement varies around the world. Catholics age 14 and up are still obligated to abstain from flesh meat on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. For those 18 to 60 on those days, Catholics should only have one full meal and two smaller meals that do not equal a full meal. 
The abstinence from meat requirements also applies to Fridays during the 40-day Lenten season. With some exceptions, Catholics are also supposed to abstain from all food for an hour before receiving the Eucharist. For the Orthodox Church, strict fasting includes abstinence from meat, fish, dairy, oil, and wine, as well as any other animal products like eggs. The Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America lists the following fast dates. All of Lent and Holy Week, every Wednesday and Friday, 40 days before the Feast of the Nativity, 14 days before the Feast of the Dormition, and a fast of about two and a half weeks following All Saints Day. However, they also don't suggest that a person new to fasting goes straight into strict fasting. Instead, different levels of fasting are given, and it is said to go up a level after a few years at one level. Holy Trinity Orthodox Church and Antiochian Orthodox Church in Arkansas has a fasting calendar with different days showing different levels of fasting. The Orthodox also fast before receiving the Eucharist, not eating or drinking anything since the time they went to sleep the previous night, or nothing after the evening meal, or nothing after sunset. Eastern Catholic fasting practices are similar or identical to the Orthodox ones. The position of the Catholic Church is that a ratified and consummated marriage between two baptized persons cannot be dissolved outside of death. If there was a real marriage, it cannot be broken. A Catholic can seek to obtain a declaration of nullity, which says the marriage was never a valid marriage, but these are not always granted. A person who obtains a civil divorce and remarries without a declaration of nullity is in a state of public and permanent adultery, and they are not allowed to receive communion. Civil divorces, however, are sometimes tolerated, though not embraced, but they aren't viewed as really breaking the marriage, which is still intact. If a person does receive a declaration of nullity, it is permissible for them to be married because they are viewed as having never been married before. Similarly, the Orthodox Church does not view civil divorce as capable of dissolving a sacramental marriage. However, many Orthodox jurisdictions provide ecclesiastical divorces to those who have been civilly divorced. For example, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America says that divorce causes a person to lose good standing in the church, and they must obtain an ecclesiastical divorce to regain it. One Greek Orthodox Church says that these are only granted in certain situations, like adultery, insanity, abandonment, or addiction. Without this, a person should not receive any sacraments or serve in councils. The Orthodox Church in America says that marriage is a lifelong commitment, but that it does permit divorced individuals to marry a second or third time. In many parts of the world today, Orthodox priests will have a beard or even entirely uncut hair, which could be a notable visible difference to the common look of the shaven face of many Catholic priests. Christopher Clitou of the Greek Orthodox Church of Cyprus says, For the majority of the Orthodox world, a beard is a recognizable sign of a priest, which is deep-rooted in Orthodox tradition. And, since a priest represents an image of Christ, he should resemble him in outward appearance with both beard and long hair. Old calendarists often teach uncut hair as a requirement for priests, and this is a strong tradition in much of the Orthodox world today, but on the whole it is not an absolute requirement, and especially many Orthodox priests in Western countries today do not have facial hair. Today, Catholic priests often have beards too. Catholics have a more systematized process for church approval of published works. The Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith decreed in 1985, the pastors of the church have the duty and the right to be vigilant lest the faith and morals of the faithful be harmed by writings, and consequently, even to demand that the publication of writings concerning the faith and morals should be submitted to the church's approval, and also to condemn books and writings that attack faith or morals. Catholics who write theological books can go through the process to get what is called an imprimatur, which comes from a bishop. Though this is not a requirement for publication, books without an imprimatur will be subject to limitations. Catholic priest William P. Saunders writes on his Catholic Straight Answers website that prayer books and catechisms require the imprimatur, and books on scripture, theology, canon law, church history, and moral or religious disciplines cannot be used as Catholic education textbooks unless they have an imprimatur. Books on faith or morals cannot be sold or distributed in a church without the imprimatur. Though it would be quite common to find that an Orthodox author of theological works would consult with their bishop for publication, and Orthodox publishers will have their own requirements, there is no systematized process of imprimaturs or restriction on distribution of books without special approval. One similarity between the Catholics and Orthodox is that both declare themselves to be the true Church of Christ. However, the similarity is also a difference because they are separate churches today. Notably, the Catholic Church has stated that Orthodox churches are true particular churches. However, the Orthodox most often do not believe the same about Catholic churches. On August 6, 2000, Dominus Iesus, a declaration by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, stated, Therefore, there exists a single Church of Christ which subsists in the Catholic Church, governed by 
by the successor of Peter and by the bishops in communion with him. The churches which, while not existing in perfect communion with the Catholic Church, remain united to her by means of the closest bonds, that is, by apostolic succession and a valid Eucharist, are true particular churches. This statement affirms the Orthodox churches as true churches. However, it is important to note that the Catholic Church doesn't view the schism as over either. The Catholic Answers website says, while Eastern Orthodox Christians have much in common with Catholics, they're still in schism. They've split off from the legitimate authority of the Pope and therefore aren't Catholics. Similarly, the Catholic Church is willing that its members receive the Eucharist in Orthodox parishes, should they be unable to get it from a Catholic parish, but the Orthodox neither allow Catholics to commune in their churches, nor allow their own members to receive in a Catholic parish. Many such differences exist between Orthodox and Catholics simply because of their own view of themselves as the true Church of Christ. Similarly, each views themselves as the church that the other split from. The differences mentioned in this series of videos are not the only differences, but the final difference I will bring up is the difference of whether these differences are actually differences. Put another way, Orthodox and Catholics disagree about how serious the differences between the two churches are. For much of what I have discussed, Catholics will point out that because there are Eastern Catholic churches that follow the Orthodox practice on the particular issue while remaining in communion with the Pope, that such differences are not really differences between Catholics and Orthodox, but simply differences between Eastern and Western churches. However, Orthodox churches tend not to see things this way. For example, Eastern Catholics allow their infants to commune like the Orthodox do. Since the Catholic Church has said that this is an acceptable practice, then there's no significant difference in the Catholic view. However, the Orthodox do view it as significant that the one billion Catholics part of the Latin Church are forbidden from allowing their children to commune. The Orthodox would similarly view some of the differences I have discussed as more serious than Catholics view them. For more on that, check out the video, What do Catholics and Orthodox Think of Each Other? For weekly videos on Christian denominations, subscribe to Ready to Harvest.